let's get us started with the second panel entitled STEAM Expo and the Future of Sciences and Arts Education. Uh, on this panel, we are fortunate to have Professor Takako Hikotani as a moderator. Um, Takako right now is a professor at Gakshuin University International Center and is also a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute in Tokyo. Uh, and right now, this winter term, she is a visiting professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. So we are fortunate that she's in the neighborhood. Um, when I first met her, she was, a, she was associate professor at the National Defense Academy of Japan. And then from 2016 to 2021, she was uh, Gerald L. Curtis, Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at Columbia University. Many of you may have met her in that capacity. Um, so she has a wealth of experience in educating young minds and uh, continues to do so now in Tokyo. So she's a, a great moderator for this session. So Takako, please take it away. Thank you, Kier, for the kind introduction. Um, hi, welcome to the second session on STEAM Expo and the future of science and arts education. Um, you might be wondering, how do all those things come together? But we have two excellent speakers. We're very lucky to welcome two pathbreakers in the field who somehow bring those four together. So it's OK if you actually don't really know what STEAM is. It's OK if you don't know what expo they're talking, we're going to be talking about, because we're going to find out. And I think it's a really important session for this meeting. Um, as Kai Kyo said, it's, they're working on very innovative ways to equip um, the new generation with the skills and mindset, I think, more impor importantly, to become innovators who are mindful of the social impact they might have. And secondly, to broaden their horizons to make a difference, not just global, uh, locally, but also globally. And I think continuing on from the last session, uh, Reiko-san mentioned the importance of imagination, empathy, and curiosity. And I think that's what they're focused on. And that's actually something that's very difficult to accomplish sometimes in a university setting. So I'm very curious to know what they have to share with us. And on this note, I'd like to introduce them. Um, it is actually in your handout as well. But let me just emphasize what I think is fascinating about what you both of you do. Um, Sachiko Nakajima um, is a musician mathematics researcher and a STEAM educator. How can you be a mathematician and a, and a musician at the same time? I don't know, but we're, gonna, we're about to find out how she accomplished all that. She's also a CEO of STEAM.inc. That's the right way to pronounce it. Um, and the representative director of STEAM um, Band Association and a thematic project pr produced for Expo 2025. And where is Expo 2025 taking place? Anyone? Do you know? <laughs> it's going to take place in Osaka, Japan. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find out more about it. And so, um, and she's also um, serves as a STEM Girls Ambassador Cabinet Office. Um, and she's a project researcher at Graduate School of Math Mathematical Sciences at the University of Tokyo. And she has won the gold medal as the first Japanese woman in the International Mathematics Olympics, while she was a, math, uh, a musician as well. That's just amazing. And she passionately conducts research on, on technology, on art, technology, as well as music, math, math, mathematics, and education. So that's mm -hmm. Sachiko-san. And we're very lucky to have you here all the way from Japan on a very short okay. visit, I understood. Um, and so um, next, we're very, I'm very happy to introduce Rie-san, who is a really also a really good friend of mine who's an assistant professor and director of initiative for education and policy, education policy innovation at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Uh, Ria's research addresses topics such as international assessments, education reforms, gender and STEAM learning. Um, she was previously a lecturer and interim director of the International Comparative Education, International Education Policy Analysis Programs at the Stanford Graduate School of Education and received her PhD and MA from Stanford University and her BA from International Christian University in Tokyo, Japan. So many of you, I'm sure, know Sria from the, your time at Stanford. And at this point, I have to plug in something that's irrelevant to this panel that I'm a pr proud Stanford grad. 
And yes. I'm actually very happy <laughs> and su surprised to know that you're having your 40th anniversary, which means that when I was here, Air Park, Air, A Park was less than 10 years old. So I'm a bit oh, shocked okay. by that. But anyway, um, and so um, Yue-san, um, she's previously worked at aid agencies such as the World Bank and Japan International Cooperation Agency. Mm -hmm. So she, her background in education is actually very diverse. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in the US or in Japan. And she helped advance equity folks education pro projects in Morocco, Tunisia, Vietnam, and Laos. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, she co-founded an education nonprofit organization, Sky Level, to promote STEAM learning and design thinking to girls living in Japan. So these are our two speakers today. We're very lucky to get to hear from them about how they got there mm -hmm. to where, what they're doing and also what they're doing right now. So first, I'd like to turn to Sachiko-san for your presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Sachiko Nakajima. I'm very honored and thrilled to be here in front of these distinguished people, uh, including online participants as well. So I would like to talk a little bit, maybe for 15 or 20 minutes, uh, about kind of STEAM activities I'm now doing and also World Expo kind of thing, yes. So, as Takako-san already introduced me a lot, but I would like to introduce myself a little bit more. So I have many faces, like first uh, music, so jazz pianist, composer, um, but I actually stopped music during my junior and high school days, and instead I got observed in mathematics. So I won the gold medal at the International Mathematical Olympiad at Indi India and silver at Argentina. And I majored in mathematics but uh, at Tokyo University. But again, I re-studied re music at the university. And after graduation, I studied my uh, professional musical music career. And the third, uh, maybe I can show you a little bit about my works. Um, like books or CDs. So, but in my 30s, I found that music and mathematics are very similar to each other and close, yeah, closely related with each other. And also I got observed in education, in the beauty of education uh, from my university days. First, I developed some programs of modern mathematics like topology or number theory or those kind of things uh, in my university days and, and in more in interactive, intuitive, experiential ways. So that was really, really fun for me. And I've been, I've been doing that for 15 years, but uh, gradually I, I actually met with the concept STEAM and I, from maybe around 2014, I started to use the word STEAM. And in 2017, I launched the STEAMing with A capital. Yes, and I've been promoting STEAM uh, in not only in Japan, but in the world, actually. So I've been really passionate to deliver the joy of creation through STEAM all over the world. So my aim somehow is to democratize creativity so we believe that everyone has a creativity inside and each creativity is different and diverse. But sometimes uh, society uh, cannot release those kind of creativities in each person, from each person. So uh, what we are doing is to, like, to release and invoke creativity from anybody beyond uh, any boundaries like uh, economical gap or gender gap or sometimes with uh, disabilities or something like that. And, but I have another face. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, I went to, uh, as a full writer, I went to NYU ITP. ITP uh, stands for Interactive Telecommunications Program. So it's an art and technology program. So I, first I learned, of course, coding, but also AI, AR, VR, something like that, and use that as a media to express yourself or do some kind of, mm, not just artistic, but also social uh, concepts. Yes, so we did uh, various projects with diversified people from all over the world, and that was really, really fun. So I, of course, I started my steaming 
before coming here. So I actually went back and forth from New York and Japan, um, did many STEAM activities, but also I myself learned STEAM. And in 2020, I went back to Japan and uh, the go government uh, appointed me to be one of the thematic project producer at World Expo. Uh, maybe you, you didn't know ex where Expo will be held, but it, it's uh, the Expo 2025 Osaka Kansai Japan uh, would be held in Osaka. Um, it's, it's will be held in uh, Yumeshima. Yumeshima is a reclaimed land. Um, so it's a not so big island, but it's, uh, it's an island. So at Yumeshima, uh, from April to October, we will have a kind of big festival, uh, Expo 2025. And the eight thematic project producers are uh, appointed, and I'm one of them. Uh, I would like to introduce this later. So uh, before going into STEAM, my STEAM activity introduction, I would like to ask you, what is STEAM? So the definition of STEAM could be diverse, maybe, but uh, sometimes I say like uh, it's a project-based or inquiry-based, curiosity-based, playful, inter- or multidisciplinary learning journey over science, technology, engineering, art, or arts, and mathematics. It's more like a, not just a learning science or mathematics, Learn, not just learning the correct correct knowledge of science and uh, mathematics, but it's more like a learning like a mathematicians or scientists or researchers or you know, make something like an artist or engineer, I think, or like an entrepreneur or inventor. So I really love this quote by John Maeda. Uh, he tweeted this in 29. He says that design is a solution to a problem and art is a question to a problem. So I think both are very, very important. So of course, if you come up with an idea, you have to shape your solutions. That's a lot design or engineering part. But also in this VUCA world, uh, I think everybody should invent your own question, like researchers or artists, anybody, I think. So even children or elderly people or anybody, I think, uh, should kind of have your own question and it could be changed every day, but it, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, I think it's a very important part. But before that also, I think playing a lot, asobi in Japanese, uh, is very, very important to get used to a new media or to the life itself. Like sometimes playing in the nature is also very important to create something new, come up with a new idea. So in Japan, now, STEAM education is being promoted by Ministry of Education, but also by Ministry of Economy. So, um, so next, Ministry of Education defines STEAM as an interdisciplinary approach to learning where people apply each academic subject to discover and solve the real life problems. So that's the definition by next. Um, also, as you may know, I didn't put those kind of information here, but um, now kind of radical revolution is being done uh, in Japan in, it, in the educational field. So for example, uh, like Giga, Giga School uh, Renovation uh, Project is done. And uh, so each person has some laptop or tablet finally uh, for, uh, yeah, in junior high school and elementary school. And also, uh, Mixed says that you should have an active, dialogue-based, deep learning. And also, the learning should be open to the society or something like that. And inquiry-based learning with no unique answer uh, are also very encouraged uh, at schools. But sometimes it's difficult for teachers to do those kind of new terms, new type of methodologies at the school. So teachers could be a little bit stressed, but I think that's why we should show more kind of cases and also show more philosophy, but also a co concrete ideas or cases, actual cases as well. And the uh, uh, right one is, uh, is introduced by Ministry of the Economy 
uh, which is uh, Learning Innovation Committee uh, in Japanese, we say Mirai no Kyoshitsu, Future Classroom. So I, I was also in the committee. And so I've been working a lot with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Economy. That, um, so Ministry of Economy announced this kind of model. So they defined uh, together, or together, they defined STEMized learning is to have waku waku playfulness in the center first, but also you should have the circulation of knowing and creating. So knowing is still important nowadays, but you should create something after knowing rap very, uh, not rapidly, but yeah, you should have the cir circulation of knowing and creating. And after that, maybe during your creation, you would like to know more about the things and you should think more. So those kind of a circulation with a center, uh, with waku waku in the center is very important. And that's what Mitty said. So our aim is to democratize creativity, playful steam. So from here, I would like to rapidly show some of my activities. So these are the artworks by uh, high school students uh, with p5.js, which uh, the coding language, which was developed for artists and designers. So children, for the first time, uh, did the coding, but they come up with many, came up with many various diversified ideas and tried to, yeah, shape that uh, with a very playful, playful bit. But uh, gradually they come up with more social ideas, but more deeper ideas later. And these are the activities uh, at Sudi Joshi. Sudi Joshi is like math girl. Uh, there is a website called Sudi Joshi. So please, if you can visit Sudi Joshi website, uh, yeah, please. Uh, because uh, many female or yeah, mathematicians uh, tried to convey the joy and beauty of mathematics on this website. Of course, anybody can access to it. But yeah, mathematics has many places. And we believe, mathematicians believe that mathematics doesn't have only one unique solution. It has more diversified ideas. So if you change the setting a little bit, you can see the things diff in a different angles. So our, we, when we do the workshop, of Sudi Joshi, we set the theme like to discover math or create with math. And under the concept, you are all mathematicians. We sometimes do this kind of workshop for girls and mothers or those who think they are females. But also, uh, of course, we do the workshop anyway, uh, all over the world as well. And sometimes we do, uh, we integrate STEAM with sports, like basketball or tag rugby, soccer, baseball. But for example, like this, um, with a mathematical model or data, we sometimes see the sports from different angles. But after that, you do the sports and find that, oh, it's not kind of, kind of different from what we thought on the board, but still you can see the things from various ways and that's, that helps you to understand what sports is or sometimes what model is as well. And, and as I said, it, those kind of students' activities gradually go into more social problems or artistic problems like music or agriculture or a traffic jam, or it's kind of where this slide, but like uh, in agriculture school or in fisheries high school or welfare kind of schools, uh, children come up, yeah, invents many interesting daily life issues. And they try to use the uh, idea of robots or sensors to shape the solutions. So those kind of prototyping and ideas are really, really interesting. So we do these kind of programs or projects uh, through sometimes online or in the real life setting. 
and we are now also collecting creativities by children of, uh, we define children as zero to 120 years old. So I think everyone here is a child. Is a child. So, but I believe that everyone has good creativity. So, but sometimes it's easier to come up with the idea from after getting some hints by other people. So we would like to collect more creativities of all over the world of what, zero to 120 years old. Yeah. So for example, the left one was done by Tamagawa, uh, Tamagawa Gakuen uh, Handwell Choir Club. They hoped to let the deaf friends to in, uh, enjoy the beauty of Handwell Choir. So that's why they started to learn coding. Of course, they, they did a lot of practice with uh, Handbell Choir, but also they tried to learn more about coding in order to uh, show the beauty of Handbell Choir. And the deaf school children as well, they, okay, so they thought that not just receiving the, those kind of things, but they also tried to uh, learn coding and they coded how to vibrate or how to uh, show the color uh, based on the sounds. Yes, so both of them learned something. Coding is not just, uh, not the only important thing, but still, uh, as a media, they learned coding to uh, enjoy the handbag choir all together, even if they cannot hear. Yes, those kind of projects are being created and done by students. Yeah. So, uh, and we, four days ago, we did the first uh, contest called Learning Harmony Contest. And there were two characteristics here. One is that we matched professional mentors to students. So students first, before submitting the works, they could choose the mentors on their own interest. They could choose four mentors to talk uh, for 15 minutes. So even if they don't know what to do, uh, sometimes they could choose a mentor uh, based on their interest. So that's uh, one challenge. And uh, another characteristic is to have uh, the target uh, in a very diversified setting, like from 0 to 18. And also we had a senior section from 40, uh, you know, 65 years old. So it was really fun. Maybe we would publish this kind of video later, so please check it. Um, I have a lot. I would like to talk. Maybe I should. OK, maybe I should finish uh, um, later. <laughs> but we need mentors as well. And also Cambodian people are now uh, enjoying those kind of activities. Um, also trying to mentor Japanese people as well. And we also um, value nature. So we sometimes do nature-based STEAM. So we really value experiential things. And yeah, so sometimes combined with AI or something. And we do more art things. Also, we, with Kyoto, Urasenke people, uh, we do the project to create the chashitsu, uh, tea room. So children would experience the very uh, authentic tea, tea way before making the tea room. But it's, it's really an interesting, inspiring project. Um, and I, I can learn also the very authentic, what, what is the core of the tea way or a tea room. And we do a lot more, like uh, innovating libraries and muse uh, museums. So this year, we did uh, a library STEAM playground project with the Ministry of Economy. Um, so we set some kind of 3D printer or rubber sensors, as well as cardboard or something like that. And we did some events. But also, they, yeah, gradually, it could be the daily life event. Uh, maybe as um, the United States already have this kind of setting in the library. But in Japan, it's not so popular. So I would like to make. Uh, yeah, in, uh, increase these kind of activities in the libraries. Yeah. 
and we do sometimes uh, camp, STEAM playground camp. And also, a Ministry of Economy start launched STEAM library. It can be also searched. I think you can search STEAM library. I actually proposed to Ministry of Economy to launch this kind of type of things because uh, we use the taxis to uh, do the, some kind of projects. So I think it should be open to everybody. So that's why in the second year and third year, uh, we, yeah, many companies started to develop some STEAM program. Uh, we are not sure which is good or not, but you can freely uh, access to it and check it and customize it or use it uh, as your own, on your own interest. And we have also eight programs there, so you can yeah, access to the same library and enjoy it. And I was also inspired by many professors at university, uh, New York University and all the innovation is being done. And I, I would skip this kind of, uh, my media art projects like slime music, musical instruments or AR doodle, music playground. But I, I myself am kind of uh, enjoying these kind of things. And I would like to talk a little bit more about World Expo. So, sorry, maybe I'm yeah, getting long, so maybe very quick introduction about Expo 2025. So, uh, so that's a Miyakumiyaku, maybe. Do, do you know Miyak Miyak? Maybe, ah, some, some of you know. Maybe, yeah. So this is kind of weird logo and Miyak Miyak are now kind of getting popular uh, in, in the world. But, um, and we have the very important theme, designing future society for our lives. So under that theme, we have eight thematic project producers and I'm the one. And I have the theme, invigorating lives with learn, play, arts, and sports. And we will have um, a one pavilion. So we will have eight pavilions, actually. So I, I and our team will have one pavilion called the Life, uh, Life Playground Jellyfish Pavilion. So maybe you can see. Designing future society for our lives. Plans are underway for the Expo's eight signature pavilions, which will reflect on and renew the concept of life. I think Expo is a festival for people and a chance for all of us to create a co-creative, inclusive, playful ecosystem of the world over various gaps. My theme is invigorating lives about play, learn, art and sports and our signature pavilion is called Life Playground Jellyfish Pavilion. Here, we are now trying to open a part of this and get connected with as many pavilions, your pavilion, or places in the world. And the journey has already begun. Let's start our various miracle collaborations from now. Yeah, so, um, so in 2025, we will have somehow a jellyfish pavilion. Uh, I don't say why we chose the word jellyfish, but uh, yeah, jellyfish pavilion would be there. But be even before that, uh, we are now doing many kinds of projects like future earth school projects, inclusive klage or garbage festival like that, and to democratize creativity. So future earth, uh, in the future earth school projects, we connect many schools, including uh, special needs education school or universities, or museums, or libraries, or all over the world. And with Tetsuo Kobori, great architect, uh, with whom I love, uh, yes, we, we will have a jellyfish pavilion. But also we will have uh, some uh, events as well, and uh, we still need some sponsorship, <laughs> so yeah. And also many teammates, more teammates, so from today, I really like, you to kind of join in this project and start something together. So we, uh, of course, math and music are kind of the center, but also we have many axes, axes uh, in the core, like a re learning revolution for one, uh, zero to 120 years old children toward inclusive, playful society. We are working with those who have kind of serious disabilities sometimes, or uh, LGBTQ or yeah, many, diversified people. And also we are very, very interested in traditional tribal music or matsuri. Uh, I didn't 
insert any Matsuri picture here, but the, we are now visiting many traditional places and enjoy those kind of, yeah, Matsuri. Um, also, we would like to show more about Japanese or global culture, authentic culture like tea way uh, with uh, uh, creative ways. And also, again, circular economy, of course, and the garbage. We will have a garbage festival in coming April. And also, I would like to globalize Japan in this, uh, yeah, making this chance, uh, making this, yeah, the use of this chance. So we would like to have the Expo Host Town system, so connecting region, regional places and countries. Yes, so yeah, those kind of ideas are being done. And sometimes we do the event with diverse people, um, like inclusive kurage or and many children are drawing kurage. Uh, kurage is a jellyfish. So, so uh, I'm very, very excited to talk more with uh, Dia-san, Takako-san from now on. And also from with you maybe later, uh, let's realize a co-creative world, playful world uh, through the creative learning all together and making the playful use of STEAM and the World Expo. Please contact me uh, if you have any questions or ideas. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to ask Yuya-san to present. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing presentation. And I'm just really grateful to be here today. I am in the presence of many people that I admire. And one of them is Takako Sensei, who has done a lot of work on US-Japan relations. I've been learning so much from you. And also for the invitation from um, Kiyo Sensei about uh, this uh, symposium. And I have drawn a lot of really interesting, wonderful insights from his work as well. And so thank you so much, Sachiko-san, for your presentation. So I will begin. Hello, my name is Rie Kijima, and I am a co-founder of an organization called Skylabo, which is an education um, organization that helps empower the next generation of STEAM learners. I'm also an assistant professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. This is where I currently live. Uni University of Toronto is a public research institute that is located in the heart of a very diverse city um, in Toronto, in Canada. Before moving to Toronto, I was a master's student here at Stanford University, then a doctoral student, then became a lecturer and an interim director um, of, at the School of Education, which is just around the corner from where we are today. So it's really wonderful to be back on campus. Um, and I've stayed here for more than a decade, uh, teaching and studying and really developing my life here. Now, before coming to Stanford, I worked in Tunisia, um, a country in the Maghreb re region, so in the northern African country, and I worked on projects related to education, like improving the quality of higher education. After being in Tunisia, I moved to Vietnam and worked in the country office there. Um, and I focused on education projects related to girls, ethnic minority students, and teachers to help improve equity issues in those uh, countries, especially in uh, Vietnam and Laos. Being and living in Vietnam is probably one of the highlights of my career. Now, growing up, I attended a very different kind of education, right? I received a very different kind of education. At this international school that I attended as an elementary school student, um, I was surrounded by so many students from different backgrounds, right? It provided an alternative kind of education for children from all different backgrounds. It was very racially 
ethnically very diverse, and there are many languages spoken at this school. And as you can see from this photo, which is a black and white photo, so it tells you how, how um, old this school is, and it's actually shut down very recently. Um, but there were also students from the US Navy. Um, so you had some US, uh, military kids and their families also part of this particular school. So growing up with children with different nationalities and background really shaped the way that I think about myself. Um, being in a very diverse learning environment in a very homogeneous society like Japan, and this is 40 years ago, right, made me quite aware of my own identity. And years later, I began to understand more and more how education shaped the way that I understood the issues and the world around me. So today, I'd like to talk about education and the role of STEAM learning. But before we begin, I'd like to contextualize a little bit about the role of education and why we think it's really important in society. So there are different rationales for why we should invest in education. The very first one is economic. We should invest or to produce, right, to invest in education because it contributes to human capital development, which then, hopefully, improves economic growth for that particular country. There are many debates about the actual linkages of education to economic development, but in general, there's an idea that when you invest in education, human capital increases, which leads to greater economic growth. Another purpose of education is social development. In order to maintain and advance the welfare of society, Right? Education serves a very important role. Children learn to read and write, become functional members of society, and contribute to social development. And education creates that social norm. Oh, sorry. Human as the f another reason why we want to think about the role of education is human right. The right to education was declared as Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and this meant that countries were required to provide education for all children. Right? This is important because that increased the students going into schooling. However, we all know that not every child goes to school, and also that not every child receives the same quality of education. Now, development psychologists like Lev Vygotsky and John Piaget, who are constructivists, have argued that education is to elevate human potential. Learning is a way to achieve their given talents and characteristics. Children construct their knowledge through interactions with others. They make meaning of the world around them through trial and error in various learning contexts. So according to Bell Hooks, a feminist philosopher, sociologist, and an education. Education is a form of individual liberation. It is an act to achieve one's greatest freedom, freedom of thought, freedom to choose, and freedom to engage. Education is a form of authentic engagement with knowledge that spurs greater consciousness in learners. So perhaps, one goal that we must strive for is to create an environment in which young learners can believe that they can change the world for the better, that they can be catalysts of change. In 2016, this is almost seven years ago, Dr. Mariko Yang Yoshihara, who's in the audience today, and I started this nonprofit organization called Sky Level to empower the next generation of STEAM thinkers. Mariko and I met here right on Stanford campus many years ago, and we have collaborative, uh, collaborated extensively every day to promote the idea of STEAM education. With the support of Professor Merida and former Associate Dean of the School of Education, Shelley Goldman, we created a STEAM design thinking curriculum for middle and high school students living in Japan. 
Our team also consists of another important member who's also in the audience, Lisa Koninamiya, who is the interim executive director of Skylabo. So we work together to advance this work, not just, just doing research, but also to be in Japan and empowering these students. Our design, we, our team designs, adapts curriculum to local contexts and implements human-centered learning programs to middle and high school students living in Japan. Then what we do is we just don't do the program itself. We actually collect data, we analyze them, and we write papers for research purposes. Now what we do is to integrate elements of STEM education and liberal arts, which we call it STEAM. Our approach leans perhaps a little bit more heavily on the E of the STEM, which is the engineering component, because there's a lot of prototyping that happens. But we emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary approach to tackling so-called wicked problems or very complex issues that are very difficult to solve, like how to cl tackle climate change. How do you address gender gap? How do you embrace diversity and inclusion in a society? These are big themes. Over the course of seven years, we have come to realize that our STEAM approach is not just simply combining coding and graphic arts or robotics with design. Our definition of STEAM is embracing the human-centered approach to tackling solutions in a more meaningful, playful, artful, soulful, needs-based solution that aims to cultivate a sense of purpose and meaning in young learners' minds. So here's a quote by Steve Jobs. Technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts that yields the results that make our hearts sing. His words reflect the very essence or the concept of STEAM that we embrace. Now, I would like to highlight some examples of STEAM learning that occurs in our program. We provide experiential learning that involves the users or someone that the team interviews, right, to understand their needs. In doing so, the participants develop a strong sense of empathy, concern for others, for the user. In this photo, a group of students are interviewing an engineer who came to speak about her experiences as a woman working for a multinational company in the electronics industry. Another example is the process that students go through to discuss, negotiate, collaborate, uh, collaborate in producing an artifact or a prototype that meets the needs of the user. So in another word, students navigate a very intensive and hands-on collaborative learning experiences to reach their collective goal, not their individual goal, but their collective goal of creating a prototype for their user. The third example is the interaction the learners have with their near peer mentors. We call them design coaches. Right? These design coaches are typically undergraduate or graduate students who are slightly older than the middle school or the high school students who participate in our program. Each team is assigned to either one or two design coaches who provide facilitation in terms of knowledge content, and they also serve as someone who can translate from Japanese to English because our program is conducted in both languages. Now, over the course of seven years, we have come to realize that our vision for education really boils down to three things. Okay? The very first one is our increasingly challenging, complex world. We need learners who have the courage, the audacity, motivation, self-belief that they can be a catalyst of social change. The second thing that we have learned from the last seven years that we believe that empathy can be cultivated and supported in learning, providing learners with an opportunity to reflect, understand, and become empathetic listeners. You might not 
necessarily agree 100% with the person who's sitting next to you all the time. And that's impossible because we all have different views. But we can provide an opportunity for these students and these learners to be at least empathetic towards each other. Third, we need to embrace heterogeneity of thinking among learners. It is the fundamental belief that each person brings to the table something unique and different. The diversity enhances idea generation and enables learners to better understand the world around them. Now, so how do we do that? We talk about these three different mindsets that we call the sky level mindset, but also the innovators mindset. The very first one is to encourage students and learners to think out of the box, that it's okay to try something different. It's okay that you're trying to bring out an idea that no one else is thinking about. And the second thing that we emphasize quite a bit is to have bias towards action. If you have an idea, make it into something that's actionable. Right? Oftentimes, we have these really great ideas and it just sits in our minds and we forget about them. Or it just kind of goes away without really developing. Just give it a try. Make it into something that's tangible so that other people can understand and take part in that idea. The third mindset that we often talk about, which I, we believe this is a really important concept, especially in our education system today, that there's so much emphasis on success, that we need to fail in order to succeed. Every time we fail, we fail forward. So that's another message that we try to um, uh, to mention in our program. Um, sorry, I think I might have skipped this slide, but I'm going to go to the to the slide on the impact. Through our research that we have conducted on collecting data from the students, we can say that there are four different things that we have identified to be very impactful in the way that we operate and we provide these educational opportunities. The very first one is that when students participate in our program, they, their interest in STEM increases. So prior to participating in our workshop, perhaps they didn't know too much about STEM, but they actually do have a lot more insights about what STEM is. The second is, the students who participate in our study demonstrate greater pro-social tendencies, such as wanting to do good for the world or to have the desire to help other people. The third thing that we have found out that the participants have a, sense, a heightened sense of creative self-efficacy. Now, this is the ability, the, the belief that you have about yourself in being creative but also to understand that those creativity can be harnessed over time. The fourth thing that we learned is that through these experiences, that students elevate their critical consciousness. They lead to greater awareness of the issues around them. And that also is linked to elevating their global consciousness. As a scholar of education, I often think about the role that education plays in the lives of children, youths, mature learners, learners of all ages around the world. I'd like to end this presentation by sharing a quote from Roseberry, Ogonowski, DeShizuno, and Warren's article, which talks about the importance of heterogeneity. As educators, we can do more to create an environment that fosters engaged learning that is grounded in intense curiosity and emergent insight. I'd like to close by sharing photos of our team. And without them, this is not possible. And we would love to obtain your insights and support as we move forward in expanding our work. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure all of you must have some 
questions that you might want to ask, but I'd like to take the privilege of being the moderator mm -hmm. to start the discussion and that um, to open for discussion um, questions later. Um, first, um, Sachiko-san, I was really struck by um, how play and the waku waku -ness. I think waku waku is a really good Japanese term, but it's excitement and fun, and that's really at the center of what you're trying to do and how you try to inspire people. And especially, you talked about how play leads to um, um, in inventing your question and shaping the solution, the two steps. And that I always want my, my students in a classroom to ask questions, and I'm frustrated when I don't get any questions, but I realized that maybe mm -hmm. there's something missing that I should have been aware mm -hmm. that there had to be a more play aspect or something that they will be waku waku about mm -hmm. that will engage uh, to make them want to ask questions. So my, um, my question to you is where do you come up with these ideas? Because I think the key that you say is that I think the chashitsu example mm -hmm. is a way for people to not take things for granted and to think about why a chashitsu is the way it is, rather than to tell people that chashitsu is this way and it has to be this way, mm -hmm. that you don't take for things for granted. And I think what you do tends to be hands-on, mm -hmm. that you, like people who are good at sports can experience through sports, and somebody who's not sports can experience through math. And I'm not good at either math or sports, so I don't know what to do. But anyway, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's just that different ways to be involved. So, so my question is, where do the inspirations come from? Mm -hmm. Does it come from feedback, working on different things and reaching out? And especially, how do you reach out to the next generation or young kids mm -hmm. who you might not think is naturally that curious? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's easy to find students who, who are curious to get to mm -hmm. you, but I think you're, what you're drawing is to try to widen the group of people who are more curious. And I think that's a really difficult thing to do. So where does your inspiration come from and what were the challenges that you had in the past? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is a very interesting question. And so um, I think we need to have some kind of safety zone in our mm -hmm. mindset. So mm -hmm. if you think that it's, I'm not good at it or I'm not confident in it, mm -hmm. and sometimes they, easily think that even adults can easily think that uh, we are told to do so mm -hmm. or something like that. So I think interest driven could be very important mm -hmm. uh, to let them actively engage in something. Mm -hmm. But usually in Japan, uh, people often, especially girls maybe mm -hmm. uh, around me, say that uh, they are not confident in having the makuaku, so having the curiosity mm -hmm. or having some mm -hmm. kind of Ski mm. likes something. So if you compare with somebody else, uh, sometimes they feel that oh, I'm, I, I don't like things that, uh, more than her or him or something like that. Mm. But um, but I, I think he, so. We, I think we have to say that it's you don't have to compare. <laughs> it's a very uh, yeah easy word. But um, yeah. First, uh, you, uh, we have to say that. And also, as for the question, uh, and of course, curiosity, I, I think it's kind of uh, not it. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you get used to being asked some question or being asked to have some question, mm -hmm. you can get used to having those kind of questions. In, I think in the United States, maybe it's better Mm -hmm. uh, for children, because they are uh, familiar with those kind mm -hmm. of circumstances. In Japan, I, I don't think it's popular mm -hmm. to be asked something so if, uh, during their childhood days. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, first, uh, even if we cannot get any good questions mm -hmm. from children or even adults, mm -hmm. I don't think we should think that, oh, it's mm -hmm. really, uh, you you you, sh you shouldn't lose confidence or, because uh, maybe they are just shy or mm -hmm. they have some sense but they cannot express that mm -hmm. uh, in a real world. So I think it, we need to ask them again and again and uh, get the sense, kind of the essence from mm -hmm. that. Even if 
uh, the answer from them could sound ridiculous. Sometimes they have some essential part in them. So yeah, that's what I think I, uh, is important to have it. Yeah, the right question. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, give them a sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. by giving them positive feedback and yeah. create different avenues where people with different skill sets or different strength can express their curiosity. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, mm. On that, um, Ria-san, I'm, mm. I'm curious to know, especially what, how your work, I think, mm. has especially focused on uh, girls or women mm -hmm. in Japan. And Sachiko-san, you mentioned the Suri Joshi project. Uh, because of the sense that maybe there is something about the education system mm -hmm. in Japan that does not empower women in a way that should be the case. So what are the things that you have done? Um, and is one of the things that you think might be opportunity to have all, all girls environment or do you think it's better to have both? Because one of the challenges mm. of these things is that maybe you want to have all the women come and help them, like maybe they need a safe place but on the other hand, you're kind of doing it at the expense of diversity sometimes. And um, so what's the right balance about like empowering women, but doing it in an environment where it's not just them? Mm -hmm. And like through your projects, I know that's really one of the focus. Mm -hmm. And what has been your experience so far? These are great questions. Um, what the studies tell us mm -hmm. is that when women have, and girls, especially middle school, high school girls, mm -hmm. who are the ones who fall out of that pipeline fairly mm -hmm. early in mm -hmm. their life. Mm -hmm. Imagine these 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 year olds are saying, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. And it seems a little too early to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Now the literature suggests that when you have support and provide opportunities, then they will take it and they will experience it. And then that creates that opportunity to go back. And perhaps we have to create that revolving door for them so that they go in and out, in and out. And then at one point you choose to go into STEM or not. Mm -hmm. And therefore that revolving door for us is to provide that support. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of literature also that suggests that when women and girls have mentors, then it, perhaps that support group can also make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we're not advocating that all girls should be separated from boys or all genders, mm -hmm. right? I think right now we have to also move away from the um, gender binary mm -hmm. idea that mm -hmm. all genders should have a space mm -hmm. in that inclusive learning environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that, we can find ways through studies that there are all ways that perhaps those individuals can feel that support. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we have embedded in the mm -hmm. design of our program mm -hmm. by creating near peer mentors. These are undergraduate, graduate students mm -hmm. who are just slightly a little senpai mm -hmm. of these students. Mm -hmm. right? So they have some really great communication and collaboration mm -hmm. and they learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of learning actually happens mm -hmm. through those near peer mm -hmm. learning even in universities, even mm -hmm. in graduate school mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Do you have um, something to add on that about the gender aspect? Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with the idea that, uh -huh. um, so especially in mathematics, uh, females' uh, percentage is very, very low, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Japan, like maybe 3% or uh, six, actually 6% six uh, of the doctor you know, uh, researchers are female. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very low. And mm -hmm. sometimes we feel isolated and sometimes cannot have some mm -hmm. friends or, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think we need mentors or some kind of community to mm -hmm. share, mm -hmm. yeah, some ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I myself was in among the boys uh, mm -hmm. and I and, uh, joined the uh, International Mathematics Olympia. So mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. I enjoyed myself, mm -hmm. but still, if it's a homogeneous culture, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you cannot say um, it maybe, so if you have only one or two female uh, mm -hmm. in the class, uh, yeah, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to mm -hmm. speak out, mm -hmm. actually. So mm -hmm. I think we need to increase the number mm -hmm. uh, first, first mm -hmm. uh, anyway, to mm -hmm. uh, have a more safety zone mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, female or gender minority mm -hmm. people. 
Um, yeah, and also it, it, uh, some research says that uh, mm -hmm. when in a competition, female girls tend to mm -hmm. feel discouraged somehow mm -hmm. um, to do a lot, and mm -hmm. boys uh, can be very encouraged to do the competition. But uh, if it's a kind of inquiry-based research or mm -hmm. curiosity-based research, sometimes uh, or social related things, mm -hmm. uh, female tend to feel very happy or uh, encouraged to do more. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing is also important. And also one more, uh, mm -hmm. the developer of the uh, events or uh, contests or are sometimes old men mm -hmm. uh, in Japan. Uh, not, yeah. So I, I think the developers uh, also should be balanced somehow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I guess one more thing that I like to add, uh, that I like to underline on, um, from both of you, is that um, once again from the previous section, as, um, the importance of curiosity, imagination, and empathy mm -hmm. emphasized. And I think it's easy to think about mm -hmm. STEAM as a curiosity and imagination thing. But I was really struck by the fact that both of you um, emphasize the uh, empathy aspect mm -hmm. and the importance of that. And such was your example of the handbell mm -hmm. and how yeah. they try to find out a way so that deaf people who cannot hear could enjoy it. That was just very inspiring and very um, interesting story mm -hmm. about how the students learn how to be empathetic, not just by being told they have to be empathetic, mm -hmm. but through action. And that was especially mm -hmm. inspiring to me. And, and one thing that didn't come up, but I'm hoping that they could become in a discussion. I think one mm -hmm. thing that's interesting that we see post-COVID mm -hmm. is that um, technological um, aspects of education all of a sudden, out of necessity, mm -hmm. became more accessible um, in Japan, I think. And it might be the silver lining in a way that it does, it does enable some students who are otherwise not able to access things mm -hmm. and access programs mm -hmm. like you to access. And it just creates a different form of uh, getting together. And that could lead to more empathy and creativeness in a collective way. Because I think another term that you both had was collective. And that, that I think, is something that tends to be not looked at when we look at these very sophisticated methods. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're talking about, we're more collective and empathetic and collective. Mm -hmm. And that, I thought, was very interesting mm -hmm. from our discussion today. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, I'd like to open the floor for this uh, for questions and there's a microphone that will be reaching you so please raise your hand and wait for the mic and and um identify yourself thank you yes so um like yeah and the next is Sakumasa. yeah please I think you need to turn on the mic or you need to speak into it. <laughs> yeah. There's interpreter, so I, I think you. you need Thank to. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm Tilly Fong. I'm from the, uh, the, the Twin Scholar in the uh, Sky. It's uh, um, Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions. Uh, I have a question for and uh, how, how to spell the name, I don't know. And the, <laughs> the lady, Satchiko. yes. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'm wondering, it's, it's very, thank you for your pre presentation. I think it's so um, impressed by the, um, by what you are doing for the future society. So um, I'm wondering how this is a business, is a company, how, what is the sustainability, I mean, and is there a business model, or what, who are the your investors for it? Uh, yeah, I, I like it, I like it quite a lot. I I'm just uh, thinking about the sustainability. Is uh, is the business how it runs well, or is it, is it very popular, or is something like that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, now we are kind of trying to challenge that kind of things uh, because. Uh, before, uh, in Japan, I think education is more like a volunteer-based thing, and we cannot earn money a lot or something like that. But uh, nowadays, we, need, we are aware that we need to have some more co-creative, sustainable ecosystem in the society. So that, we, yeah, so we need sometimes money to 
hire people and set up things and new technology. So I, I think we need more uh, engagement from the public sector, uh, I think, so like uh, text-based things. And also, and uh, what, why we are trying to use libraries or museums are uh, because uh, we think that we need to use public spaces, uh, but it's all are, they, they have some funds uh, to uh, maintain those kind of things. So uh, I don't think each school has a great uh, technical environment, for example. But uh, I think if you, you can use uh, those kind of public things as well and share, uh, so common mm -hmm. things, uh, then I think it could be more easier. And also big companies, for big companies, they are now trying to uh, kind of innovate their business model as well. So sometimes it's, it could be, uh, we, we could ask them to uh, send some people to in, in those kind of things, or sometimes invest things, uh, uh, invest money to new challenges uh, in a school system, or maybe integrate it with other resources like a university or yeah, those kind of things. So I think there could be a lot of way to create some new business model in the educational field, but we should have many ideas and try it. Uh, yeah, that, that is the answer to your question. So thank you very much for your great, great presentation. And I'm Kazunobu Sakuma from uh, APARC. And I'm a, a member of Global Affiliate Program. And I, I have some, uh, some experience in uh, educating uh, people in several schools. So uh, my question and cons uh, uh, interest is, uh, I think um, uh, the challenge and uh, educational reform uh, to make uh, people more innovative and creative is how to, how to change the mindset of uh, those who grew up in the older days that received some kind of old style education that I focus on the memorize and to learn the uh, same way of learning or thinking. And so because um, uh, they do are um, engaged in education as a teacher or uh, sometimes they have a great power uh, to introduce some uh, new way to uh, education or some edu organization now or educational reform and uh, educational institution. So uh, my question is very vague and not focused, but um, I would love to uh, hear your idea to, uh, how to change the, to uh, change the, uh, the old people's mindsets. So thank you very much. <laughs> I wonder if like who's invited, included in old people, but would you, would you start? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. I also study quite a bit about education reforms. <laughs> so I've been thinking quite a bit in terms of reforms that happen at the structural level, mm -hmm. as well as the regional um, levels, and then also at the local level. There are various ways in which we think about reforms, that it comes from policy, or does it come from the bottom up? Now, I'd like to share one very concrete example in which I think a reform is happening, and that is the case of Kyotangoshi. Now, we have a partnership with Kyoto. Uh, it's a city in kyoto -fu, which is called Kyotango. And there, there are many visionary education experts. We work with the Board of Education. This is a public education system. Now the change makers at the ministry, uh, sorry, the Board of Education at Kyotango are so forward looking that we came in and it was such an amazing collaboration. What they are trying to do is to reform education. There are many challenges that they face. The population is decreasing. The number of schools is declining. Teachers are no longer as demanded Right? They are, there are not that many teachers who can teach in these classes or in these classrooms, or the number is dis decreasing over time. There are challenges that Kyotango experiences that are very similar to the challenges that other cities are facing in Japan. But what they're trying to do is to bring in something like we talked about today into their education system. 
and that is to work with the teachers. If the Board of Education says, let's do this, the teachers follow. If the school principal says, let's do this, then there is an opportunity for change. Now the students, how do they take this? The students are so malleable. They're so adjusting. They're so excited about these new opportunities. So it's not really the students that we need to change. It's the systematic, the system-wide, the, the structures of education. But if we work with champions, if we work with these reformers who are forward-thinking, very progressive in their ideas, they want to try something different. With the right leadership, it happens. So that is one example that I think is worth mentioning. Thank you. Um, I have this. Um, th I'd like to ask Sachiko san for the same question because one of the things that you presented in your slide mm -hmm. is the introduction of um, COIL, which is collab collaborative online interactive learning. Yeah. And if you're teaching at a university in Japan, somewhere in the higher ups are saying you have to do COIL, mm -hmm. and that we don't. We're, we're like, okay, we have to do COIL. What exactly is COIL? How it, it's really hard to do a um, new method introduce that into the course. So a, a lot of things you said were actually very useful to me. Oh, maybe this is the way I can do it. And I also think that mm. like, like top down is good, but like how exactly can mm. be really hard. Mm -hmm. So how to um, spread your ideas, both of you, for the way you teach, but, but sort of at the same time, teachers tend to be proud of the way they teach. So how do you make new mm. things and new methods mm. happen? Um, and what has been your experience? Because Sachiko-san, I think you went to schools to do things, mm -hmm. right? Because they had examples. What has you, what have been your experience with the teachers there? Yeah. Are they happy they're there or do they feel challenged or yeah. uh, what is it like? Yeah, of course it depends on teachers and I okay. know that friends, uh, uh -huh. teachers, uh, are feel, can feel safe, safe uh -huh. and feel relaxed and to challenge new things. But if you don't know the teachers mm -hmm. and if they think that uh, they are told to do so, mm -hmm. it's kind of sometimes, it, it's quite similar to children, mm -hmm. I think. So adults and children are very similar. Mm -hmm. So I, I think active learning for children should be also done for mm -hmm. teachers, I think. Mm -hmm. So teachers should experience those kind of active project-based learning or experience some new things mm -hmm. uh, in a safety zone, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe as you may know, uh, uh, Carol Dweck uh, uh, introduced the idea of mind, uh, growth mindset mm -hmm. and fixed mindset. And so mindset is how to set the mind. So I think we have both uh, mm -hmm. fixed mindset and uh, growth mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think it's very natural to that you feel scared to challenge new, new things or, mm -hmm. or change yourself or mm -hmm. something like that. But if you kind of learn to set your mind to mm -hmm. be more, to feel more, find some playful things or mm -hmm. similar part uh, in mm -hmm. uh, the things that you're mm -hmm. told, then I think you could be more mm -hmm. relaxed and feel more active or engaged in that. So it's kind of, um, yeah, um, conceptual things, but that still sometimes we have to do the uh, say that mm -hmm. thing, kind of thing. And also I think the value, uh, we have to value the weakness nowadays. Mm -hmm. In order to be creative, I think weakness could be the hint. Um, mm -hmm. So if you feel scared, that's very great because we can uh, find more creative ways to uh, change the world or something like that. So I think teachers should be ha should have the safety zone first mm -hmm. and feel that they are okay and uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the first thing uh, mm -hmm. we have to do in our next generation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end of this session, but I think we're all um, inspired and very much waku waku by the two speakers. <laughs> so I hope we can yeah. convey our waku waku mm -hmm. to the next generation in any form that you might engage with the next generation. So thank you very much. Um, thank you to the speakers. Please uh, join me in a round of applause to the thank two speakers. You. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm.